Gordy Tamayo, Brandon Stubbs with TitleFight.com. Want to recap and retouch up on this past weekend's extravaganza with the one. And Brandon and I were there uh, firsthand to be able to touch base on some of the festivities there. It was just a pretty local weekend. And we had some surprises take place. We had some other stuff that was not so much of a surprise, but all the way around. A uh, pretty great fight week. Brandon, want to kick us off? Uh, kick us off where we want to start off with the card there. I mean, we had some drama take place at the main event, but we also had some other dramatics in, a, in another light uh, take place on, on the co-main event, too. And um, just kick us off wherever you want to touch base on what was your overall you know, take on how the, how the weekend went. Well, overall, the weekend was it was tremendous and very good for the sport of boxing. Uh, it was definitely the biggest event ever for the sport, and you just kind of hope that they can keep that positive energy and momentum going forward and all uh, other events they have closing out 2013 and going forward. Um, as far as the card itself, the, the co-main event was definitely the, the fight of the night, which a lot of people knew and had a feeling would happen anyway between Lucas Matisse and the champion Danny Garcia. Uh, Garcia was one, you know, initially when this was announced, I was like everyone else. Uh, Garcia is going to get murdered. He's going to get crushed. It's going to be ugly. And, you know, the last couple of weeks leading into the fight, I just kind of was watching more and more of Garcia's fights. And I was thinking, you know what? This kid's pretty smart. He's going to probably just outbox or run around the ring for 12 rounds and, and beat Matisse that way. He didn't run, but he definitely outboxed him. He showed he had a massive chin, even with his mouthpiece flying out of the ring right. at one point in the fight. Uh, that he just showed just so show much heart and just showed so much um, of his skill level and his skill set that a lot of people question without a doubt. Now, you can't question that. He is legitimately the best 140-pounder in the world. You now have to start putting his name in there amongst the top fighters pound for pound if he wasn't already in your list. It was just overall just a... a um, just an overly impressive performance by Danny Garcia and, and Lucas Matisse as well. I mean, the guy fought with one eye for pretty much half the fight. Mm -hmm. uh, with his eye closing up, he, he kept pushing, kept going forward, but just unfortunately just didn't have enough uh, to overcome Garcia there in that bout. You know, speaking on, on that concept there, I mean, we were listening on the radio show the other day, uh, or yesterday actually, with um, Back Culture and uh, Ismail, I believe, that was on the show, made a really good point in, in referring to a lot of Garcia fans that might have been pointing the finger and being like, you know, Matisse ain't nothing, you know, look what happened, blah, blah, blah. But he made a good point as well in saying that, you know, not to discredit Garcia's win by, you know, diminishing, you know, Lucas Matisse and what he brought to the table here because he is a good fighter. He is a heavy puncher, regardless of some people like Devin Alexander saying, hey, he's overrated in his power. Well, he, he knocked his mouthpiece off. He's knocked off a couple people's socks as well. So he's got something there. Danny Garcia did his thing, you know, he's, he fought a smart fight, he obviously did his homework on the guy, and he had a better game plan that he came through. What would you say to those people as well that are, you know, pointing the finger down at Matisse saying, hey, told you so, you know, he, he isn't all what he was cracked up to be, I mean, is there some truth to that, or are people just blind? I, I think people are just a little bit blind, they want to have blinders on in regards to that, and just kind of, I think downgrading Danny's win there is just, you know, don't don't downgrade Matisse because Matisse can pretty much beat, I would say, 95% of the other fighters there at 140 pounds. Um, I mean, he fought a close fight against Evan Alexander, close fight against uh, Zap Shooter. Um, all those are, you know, somewhat contested losses on his end. So you can't discredit anything that man has done. Um, you know, it's going to be interesting going forward how he reacts uh, to this loss because this was obviously the biggest fight of his career. Now, if he goes on a downward slope after this, okay, then you can maybe look at this and say, well, maybe this wasn't such a great win for Danny. But as far as it stands right now, this was a tremendous win for Danny. Uh, Lucas Matisse is, you know, you can make the argument him being the legit number two 140-pound fighter in the world. Uh, but again, if he goes on a slippery slope and starts going downhill, then you may uh, then call this victory into question as far as Danny Garcia goes. So what's going forward from here? I mean, Danny Garcia, impressive performance, you know, big win on his notch right now. Um, going forward, of course, everybody, first thing on their, out of their mouths after the main event is, you know, Mayweather sweepstakes. Who's taking him on next? You got Devin Alexander throwing stuff out. You got Khan in the mix. These two fighters with Garcia and Matisse were ones that were in in, uh, in route to, to possibly be at least in the running for it there. 
Um, what's on the table for for Garcia going going there for Pandora's box is open now. Everybody is is talking about potential matchups. What's on the table for him? You know that that's going to be interesting because he could chase the money and he could try to go out the floor. Um, I honestly think he's at least one more fight away from that. I, I would even say two more fights. Um, you know, two fights at 147 just to kind of test himself out and see how he actually feels there at that weight before he makes that move. Um, really beyond that, if he were to stay in the division, there's not much there. Um, maybe a rematch with Zab Judah down the line. That's kind of sort of possible. Um, it won't be against Mike Alvarado, who's a title holder because he's a top-ranked fighter and he's still got a, a fight here uh, in a month that he's got to get past. Um, so really, you get beyond those two guys, there's not much left for him at 140. So it's going to make the most sense if it's, you know, with his handlers, what you, what they should do is get him against a, uh, a name at 147 to test it out there and then see how he, how he reacts, how he fights. Um, if he fights well, he reacts well, and is victorious, then maybe he'll enter themselves to the point made with a sweepstakes. Or something I suggested that I think honestly makes more sense and can make, I wouldn't say more money, but would definitely make a bigger splash and kind of separate um, who's the next up in boxing is maybe him and Adrian Broner going at it in 147 at some point in 2014. I really think that if, between those two men, that's going to be who's going to be the leader as far as the next great pound for pound fighter and hold that torch that Floyd Mayweather currently holds. Yeah, you know, I, lo I love that matchup there. And, and regardless of what some people were saying, you know, about these two being friends or whatnot, as a good Twitter friend, Dr. Bios stated recently here, hey, friends fight for money all the time. You know, it's a business, right? So, you know, why wouldn't these two decide to get it on there? Whether or not their their managers would and their advisor, um, you know, the the one and only Al Heyman would decide to piece these two together again. Uh, it's still in question there, but I definitely love that matchup. I think that would be definitely a, a separator between, you know, showing who's the elite and the main dude on top of the division there. That would be phenomenal to see something like that map out. So let's keep our fingers crossed. Moving on to the main event, uh, we've seen, of course, pound for pound great Floyd Mayweather step up against the, the young and rising Mexican star Saul Canelo Alvarez. I mean, Brandon, we were both there for the weigh-ins and seeing just how psycho people were getting inside of the, the MGM Grand there. And uh, the build-up to this fight was... Nothing less than surreal. Uh, a lot of hype going into it. Um, a lot of build up for it. Canelo obviously fell short, regardless of one of the scoring. That we won't give too much shine on that any more than what's been done already. But one sided clinic from Floyd Mayweather. Hats off to him once again. The guy showed his his greatness and what he's capable of doing there. We we, we talked about it, and you said that uh, this is what you were expecting in some way, shape, or form. But what was your overall take after you did get decided to watch that and and reflect on it? You know, it's, it just shows once again that it, there is no blueprint, as Oscar De La Hoya would like to say, uh, to beating a, a, a guy like Floyd Mayweather. Um, you can try different tactics, and they just don't seem to work. Uh, when he's on, he's on, and there's nobody out there who can beat him. Um, he just seemed just so much faster, so much fluid there in the ring. It, it was kind of what I thought it would be. Honestly, you know, I kind of thought it was going to be more on the lines of what he had to deal with when he fought Miguel Cotto. Um, but Canelo just could just never get in a rhythm. And, and that was the big thing. Floyd's good at breaking a fighter's rhythm uh, with his defense and, in this case, his aggression early in the fight, which just kind of threw uh, Canelo's rhythm off right from the get-go. No one really expected Floyd to come out and be the aggressor early on. And once that happened, Canelo really was kind of, he was throwing for a loop. He, he really didn't know how to react. He got frustrated many times during the fight and, and, and did tactics that's very uh, not like him, not like his character. And he even said in, in the post-fight interview that he was frustrated. Um, during the fight with some of the things that were going on and out, he was unable to really get off anything. So um, not surprised at all uh, in the outcome, uh, just a little bit surprised in the actual performance by Canelo, or lack thereof in this case. No, definitely was in a position where he wasn't able to get in, in any kind of rhythm like he stated there, and he just uh, was made to look as Floyd Mayweather predicted as a sparring partner, if not you know, even less so. So um, props to Floyd for doing 
once again what he does best. What's on, what's going forward here for, for Canelo? Obviously the kid's young. He still has a lot of room for improvement, a lot of growth that uh, you know he's capable of, of moving into here. He's got a great marketing machine behind him here. What's on the table for this guy? I mean, the, the landscape almost seems like the sky's the limit still. He's already got people calling out his name. What do you see taking place next? I mean, in his case, it's almost like this is going to hit the uh, career reset button for him. Um, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how he uh, comes off of the first career loss, how he mentally comes back off of that. He did take a physical beating in this fight, so physically he should be perfectly fine. It's going to be all mental for him going forward. Um, as far as what's next for him, you know, like you said, he's got the machine behind him in Golden Boy. They have a stable of fighters at 154 they can throw at him. Um, if he wants an immediate title, he could go up to newly crowned uh, champion Carlos Molina, who also was down in one undercard when he defeated Ishii Smith. And I captured about there. Um, if he's wanting a big money fight, though, um, the and it's going to kind of be contingent on what happens here in a couple of weeks. He could go after Miguel Cotto, which is a fight they were trying to make once before. Uh, that is maybe the most obvious and maybe the fight that makes the most sense as far as money goes, as far as something that you can put a the machine behind, but you got to wonder if Gold Boy wants to put him immediately in a fight in, in of that magnitude right after a loss. Uh, would he take a tune-up fight? Would he take on a Carlos Molina, face Miguel Cotto, then maybe later in 2014? You know, that those are all possibilities. Um, another name thrown out was Alfredo Angulo. Um, they can make, you know, a Mexican ball that would so sell uh, and would be very fun to watch. So, I mean, he has a lot of different options here. It, it's, it's one of those things that they want to throw him right back into the fire and get right back in the title on mix in 154, or if they want to have him take a tune-up fight before they go back in the mix. As far as Floyd's concerned, we know he's going on a hiatus for a minute, going to be taking a vacation before he resumes uh, coming back again, which, you know, he's still got a couple more fights on the contract. Slayton is going to be fighting a couple more times next. A couple names have been thrown out there in the mix. I mean, really, does it does it matter a whole lot at this point who they put in front of him, or is he just going to blow through them all just like he did this past weekend here? Um, what makes the most sense for, at this point anyways, uh, next person in line for Floyd Money Mayweather? See, this is where things can get really, really tricky because, quite honestly, what is there left for him to fight that we want to see that fans would pay for? Now, granted, people are going to come out in droves to watch Floyd Mayweather fight because either they're a fan of him and his work or they want to see him lose. Um, the thing is, there's not many guys out there who can legitimately challenge him now. We heard the crazy talk of Bernard Hopkins saying, hey, he made him at 160. Mm. Let's face it, that's not going to happen. That's just pure crazy talk. I think his old age is finally catching up to him <laughs> in that regard. Um, if anything, if anyone was going to drop down and wait, the kind of sort of could make sense and can make a lot of money would be him meeting Sergio Martinez at maybe 155 or 154. Um, that could make sense. That should be able to kind of sort of get done. Uh, TV deals with a showtime and HBO may make things a little sticky there. But that would be maybe the next big money fight um, that's really on the table. Beyond that, there's not much. I mean, he can kind of wait and see what the landscape uh, happens, you know, here at 147. Uh, after the first quarter of 2014, it, I doubt if he can get a deal done but to maybe face Tim Bradley if he's uh, victorious over uh, Marquez here in October. Um, he's not going to probably fight Adrian Broder because Adrian Broder, her person, is big bro. Like I said, I think Andy Garcia is a fight away still from that happening. Um, then there's, you know, the winner of Amir Khan, Devin Alexander. The problem with that is if Devin wins, Devin doesn't have a fan base. Uh, that can really travel and it would bring out droves and, and spark that interest. Um, if it's a mere con, granted they're going to throw that Dubai money at him again to see if he would be willing to go over uh, and fight in Dubai and make money there, but Floyd's never going to leave Las Vegas, and we know that for a fact. That's just not going to happen. So it's going to be interesting to see. The thing is, the bright side of his part, he has tied. Uh, mm -hmm. He doesn't have to worry about making a matchup and really pushing a pay-per-view until sometime late February, early March uh, for a pay-per-view. So it, it'll be interesting to see, but it's going to really depend on what happens in the landscape uh, between really 160 to 140 over the next four months. 
Yeah, definitely a lot of unknowns there, but definitely interesting nonetheless there. Well, Fight Freaks, Fight Fans, thanks for tuning in once again. Gordy Tamayo, Brandon Stubbs, you can check us out at Punch underscore to the face and the title fight on Twitter. Be on the lookout for Uncut Raw Access coming straight from Brandon Stubbs himself in the upcoming weeks here. And we'll talk to you soon.